Welcome back to another world history lesson. Uh, we are going to be taking a look at the Renaissance here today. So some things we need to know beforehand. Uh, we want to show you kind of just a basic timeline of what's going on here uh, just to get our bearings. So we looked at the Middle Ages already. Uh, that was about a thousand year period from the fall of Rome to this time frame. Uh, where we would maybe argue that things were not as advanced or um, enlightened as they will be um, here. Uh, and that's a fairly subjective um, uh, argument to make, uh, analysis to make of the situation, uh, because there was stuff going on in the Middle Ages. But the people in the Renaissance wanted to say they were doing something newer, they were doing more thinking than that had been done before, and so they call their time their time the renaissance and we're going to talk about what that means here in a second uh after the renaissance or as really actually part of the renaissance we're going to have two other movements actually three other movements uh there's the reformation uh which is going to be based around christianity there's a scientific revolution which is going to be based around new scientific discoveries and also in addition with all that we've got the age of exploration going on at the same time that's kind of combined with all this uh after this time frame though we are going to have then something called the enlightenment and then after the enlightenment uh, we will have something called the Age of Revolution. Um, that's really what's going to drive us into, uh, we're going to see that really the Enlightenment and the Age of Revolution a lot more next semester um, when we get into uh, the colonization of the Americas and then the eventual um, revolution of those colonies against their uh, parent countries. So, uh, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so feudal Europe, just a couple things to remind you of uh, that we saw. Um, Europe was divided into several independent kingdoms, and uh, the feudal Europe was defined by the idea of feudalism, where you've got that strict social caste, or not caste system, but s strict social structure system of peasants or serfs, uh, knights, uh, and maybe some skilled workers, merchants, and stuff like that. Then you got your nobles, and then you got the king at the top. Uh, it's also defined by the plague, especially towards the end of it, uh, that uh, drastically changes the landscape of people uh, and where they're living and how they're living. And it was also defined by the church, which is why we had the crusades that went and tried to conquer the Holy Land in the name of uh, God. So um, you've got those three things that are really kind of the, the defining features of it. And we're going to see those change drastically here during this time frame. So philosophy of the Middle Ages. Well, it's a lot of it's based on Christianity. All the ideas, the, the concepts are going to be based around the idea of Christianity. Um, there's going to be a major fear of witchcraft. And honestly, we might say that that kind of goes away, or the Renaissance would like to say that that goes away. The Reformation would like to say oh, they've gone away from that. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, witchcraft and, and the fear of witchcraft is going to continue well after this. Uh, you got the famous instances of witchcraft here in the United States. Um, so that's happening in the 1600s. So it's, it, it doesn't go away just because the Renaissance happens. Um, also, new ideas are not as uh, appreciated. Um, they're kind of quashed or squashed um, and that they're, they're kept down. Um, there's the idea of the Duns Scotus, uh, which gets us the term dunce. Uh, that is kind of an example of this um, and that it wasn't necessarily good to be uh, coming up with new ideas and challenging things. And the reason why you don't want to challenge new things and, and come up with things or challenge people and come up with new things is because there is an expectation to respect authority, whether that be the church or the king or whoever was above you. You weren't supposed to go out of your lane. You're supposed to stay in your lane, not complain and just smile and nod when people say stuff to you, even if you don't like them. Um, so that's the Middle Ages and what is going to be pushed back against here in the Renaissance. Um, Renaissance literally means rebirth, uh, and it is a rebirth of Greek and Roman ideas. Um, so we're going to see them looking back to ancient Greece and Rome for ideas on art and what is a good art style uh, in philosophy, in ways to live your life. All that kind of stuff is what they're going to be focusing here. Um, and there's going to be an increased interest in history, literature, and art during this time. Um, so where does it begin? Uh, and it begins in Italy. Now, why does it begin in Italy? Well, if we're dealing with them, uh, if we're talking about them being based off of Greek and Rome, uh, Italy is a great place because there's Greek ruins as well as a lot of Roman ru ru ruins. Um, really, a lot, a lot of Roman ruins are there. Um, several of the cities that are big cities here in this time frame, were originally set up as Roman colonies or um, were Roman 
cities and you have the Roman architecture and all that stuff in them. They're also a center for trade, which means there's a lot of money coming through. And uh, because this is where Rome was, a lot of the Byzantines, when the Byzantine Empire falls, partially because of the Crusades, they will come and flee over to Italy to try to find a new place to settle instead of being a part of that empire. And of it, or in Italy, the main head place is going to be a city called Florence. Uh, it is going to be the center of it because it is the center of banking and trade uh, and textiles. And there is one family that really sets this all off, and that's going to be a family called the Medici family. And they, instead of hoarding all their money, uh, are going to decide to spend their money. Well, they're going to hoard a lot of it, but then they're going to spend it on having artists make great works and stuff like that. And it's really a way for them to show like how they're giving back to the community. But instead of giving the community money and stuff like that, they give them artistic things that are cool. Now, some of the values of the Renaissance um, that really kind of give us the definition of what the Renaissance was and what it was based around are, we're going to say there are kind of six factors. Um, depending on who you talk to in history, you'll get more, you'll get less, you'll get these weren't really big deals, they were big deals. But um, really kind of the big thing that I would say with these uh, is they give us a foundation for what we see as valuable today and what we want to see in people today. And this is why probably the Renaissance is looked at as a really big idea is more because of its connection to us today than it was actually a drastic change from things before. Because this change didn't just happen overnight or at the snap of a finger or anything like that. It happened uh, uh, kind of fast, but also not lightning speed or anything like that. It took years and you can see the movement was hundreds of years long. So these values that I went on a long tangent there, sorry, are well-roundedness, mean, meaning you're good in many different areas. Okay. This is what we do with our school system today. Why do we have you doing science and art and math and history and English and all that stuff? Because we want you to have a solid foundation in many things. Do we expect you to be an expert in everything? No, but we do expect you to be well-rounded or we hope to make you well-rounded by the end of your years here. Um, individualism, this is a focus on the self and what your interests are and what you want to do. If you want to make art on this thing, then you should be able to go and do that. You don't have to do what your family did or what other people did. Now, this is usually a privilege of only those that were in the upper classes and those that could afford to get an education and stuff like that. The common farmer was still probably farming. Uh, secularism is an idea of focusing on living in this world, not worrying about the afterlife. So you have a little bit of lessening of the power of the church here, as well as it's about fixing this world and making this world a little bit better, which brings us into humanism, which is that humans have a lot of potential. They've got their logical creatures that can solve a lot of problems and we don't have to necessarily wait for God to solve the problems for us. So you've got humanism there. Uh, skepticism questions things. Um, it is something that we look for all of you guys to be able to do is question things. Um, and it's what you guys are pushing whenever you answer any of our assessments. You guys are working that skeptical idea of challenging certain uh, notions and making your own argument. Um, humanism we see today with uh, calls to change things. You see that a lot with the uh, global warming movement and that people can solve this and that it's not necessarily a inevitable thing that's going to happen. Um, and secularism is something that you see in our government as well, focusing on making connections here. Um, because you, you see that we're supposed to have separation of church and state in here in the United States, that is something we say we value and that we push for. And that starts all the way back then. Did they have that same idea of secularism when we're say, talking about secularism today? No. Uh, it's something that's changed over time, but this has gotten the ball rolling on that. And the last thing is classicism, which is looking back at that ancient Greece and Rome and going, that's a model to look back at and, and, and see things and, and repeat things up. Um, this is not something that's necessarily seen a ton today. We don't have a lot of Greek and Roman architecture. We're not, our arts aren't necessarily based on that stuff. But the idea of democracy and republic relate back to Greek and Roman culture. And so that political system has continued as well as there are some people that see it as really important to still see and view the classics of uh, the ancient world. Um, one thing for me was uh, I, I got to learn Latin in high school because uh, well, we thought, or my school thought it was important to still have Latin around, and you will still see that on the East Coast and in some big schools there and stuff like that. So those are the Renaissance values. Um, they are things that we can see throughout the whole Renaissance, as well as we can see that they have an impact long term to us today. The Renaissance man, this the quintessential person of the Renaissance, an example that would be Leonardo da Vinci, is someone that has their own thoughts, is doing their own things, but also is good at a lot of different things. Um, they are not just doing one thing. So they're not just an artist painting. They are doing painting. They are doing sculpting. They are 
uh, inventing things. They are doing architecture and design and stuff like that. Uh, the whole idea is to be a complete person and to be able to do a lot of things. And um, so this is getting into the idea of humanism as well as individualism and maybe a little bit of skepticism that you're challenging things, trying to come up with new things, um, as well as very much well-roundedness because you're doing many different things well. Now, <coughs> sorry for the cough there. Moving into the art, because that's the big thing that like when people think about the Renaissance, the big thing that is thought of is the arts and architecture. And uh, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Donatello, your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are excellent examples of this stuff. Um, and so this art was a drastic change from before. Uh, the themes that you're going to see in them are different than the medieval themes. Um, we're going to do some stuff in class with this uh, later in the week. We're going to do some major comparisons of medieval versus Renaissance art. But... For the scope of this, we're just going to focus on what the Renaissance art was like. And you're going to see either classical themes there, meaning like you're going to see Greek and Roman mythologies and, and stuff like that, or Greek and Roman history. You're going to see individual portraits of people. So that's kind of getting into that individualism because uh, there wasn't a way to do a selfie back then. So the way you did a selfie is you paid someone hundreds or thousands of dollars to do a portrait of you. Uh, or it was religious reasons because people are still, even though we're seeing secularism, they are still very, very devoted to uh, Christianity. And the church will be one of the major patrons of this. And a patron is someone that, uh, we'll, we'll see that come up a little bit later. I'm jumping ahead on that one a little bit. But we're going to see the, the church sponsoring um, the artwork here, which is what a patron does. Um, Architecture-wise, we're going to see a rebirth of arches as well as domes and columns, uh, which the uh, Middle Ages had kind of gone away from. And painting-wise, we're going to see an idea called linear uh, perspective, which is going to make things look 3D, in that you're going to have a vanishing point there. You're going to have uh, artwork looking like it's 3D, like it's realistic, like you can go out and touch it, or you could run into it. It's just like if you've ever watched the Looney Tunes cartoons, or any cartoon for the matter, most of them have it, where someone draws something on the wall and they start running through that. That's the perspective idea in, um, in application there. Um, so everything's going to look lifelike. Things are going to look very proportional. Um, you're going to see shadows. You're going to see a lot of symmetry and geometry going on in there because that's what they found pleasing. So that's the art and architecture. Here are some examples of it. Um, <clears throat> sorry for the coughing again. Uh, but we've got the Sistine Chapel here on the left. Uh, you can see this is done by Michelangelo um, with his last judgment. He also did the ceiling. Uh, we've got some da Vinci here on the bottom left with the Mona Lisa, as well as I believe this is a self-portrait of him or a self-sketch of him. And you've got uh, his Last Supper right there. Uh, I cannot remember who did this one of Jesus being laid to rest, uh, but you've got that, as well as you've got another one of Jesus here on the cross. So all these pictures you can see uh, a lot of religious um, I, wow, I didn't bring up any Greek or Roman ones in there, but we've actually seen some Greek and Roman ones, uh, myths earlier. Um, you can see some individualism here with the Mona Lisa there, but a lot of it's religious because it was still a very religious time. Uh, architecture wise, we're going to see a lot of different things. You can see some sketches of columns and, and arches. Um, you can see this famous uh, cathedral known as the Duomo, uh, with a dome. Uh, it was the first dome built since the Roman empire in Western Europe. Uh, and you've got some other things here, like, again, arches and all that kind of stuff for the Renaissance architecture. Uh, and then lastly, you've got a lot of sculptures that are done uh, in this time. Uh, they are made out of bronze here. This is a statue of David uh, in the middle. Uh, and then on the left, um, you've got some Greek and Roman mythology playing out. And uh, this is the Sabine women being taken away from their um, men uh, in ancient Rome. It's a it's a uh, mythological story about part of the founding of Rome, uh, as well as you can see in the back there, that is uh, Hercules or Heracles beating up a centaur. And then on the right here, you've got Moses. So we're back to religious things here. Um, these two, Moses and the uh, statues you see on the left, are all from uh, Michelangelo again. Um, you might notice that like Moses is wearing like rabbit ears or something like that. And that is because Michelangelo mistranslated. Um, some of the uh, Old Testament, when he was reading about it, he mistranslated a word for halo or glowing orb around him for horns. And so he uh, put giant horns on Moses for whatever reason and didn't realize it until after the fact and then ground them down some, but there was still some left over. And so you can still see the horns on his head there. So fun little random fact there with that. 
And uh, yeah, that's uh, another, the bottom right is an altarpiece. I can't tell you who it's by or what it is, but it shows you some sculptures and Roman uh, Greek columns and stuff like that. Now, the Renaissance wasn't just about art. It was also about um, writing. Uh, and uh, there was lots of new books that were published. Uh, one of the major inventions that's going to enable us that we'll look on the next slide is going to be the printing press. Um, but there are a lot of new books that are written. Uh, and they get spread out throughout the whole of Europe because of the printing press. Uh, and they will go and revisit Greek philosophy. So you'll see people reinterpreting people like Aristotle and Plato. Uh, you will see people writing new histories of Italy and the cities that they're living in or making critiques on the Roman Empire before them. Uh, you will see people writing new plays and poems and novels. Uh, really, this is a big thing. This is where you start to get to the entertainment of actually going and seeing plays consistently or reading books. Um, some of the famous books that we're going to see, well, they're on the next slide, but I'm going to kind of spoil things. Uh, there's the famous The Prince by Machiavelli, which we see up at the top right here. Uh, there's the famous plays by uh, Shakespeare. Uh, so all your Shakespeare plays, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Antony and Cleopatra, all those are from this time frame. And uh, you also get humanist critiques, so more nonfiction type stuff uh, going and uh, saying, here's what we should be doing and, and how we should live our lives and all that kind of stuff. As well, there's a lot of new inventions, new guns, new cannons, uh, other weapons. Uh, anatomy uh, starts to be done and that people start dissecting people to understand how the human body works. And there was actually really a practical reason behind it doing anatomy, and that was if you dissect the body, you can understand what the body looks like under it. So then you can make more realistic paintings. Um, and so you've got people that start to analyze the human body to see how it functions. So you can make more realistic art, but also it leads to better science um, or better, uh, well, science and, and being able to be a doctor and heal people from injuries and uh, illnesses and stuff like that. So I mentioned this on the previous slide, uh, movable type printing press uh, is a huge invention during this time and it allows all this information to spread. Uh, it's created by a guy named Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, there were printing presses before, but the printing presses before, every time you wanted to print something, you had to carve it into wood and you would use that wood for as long as it lasts, or you might make a cast uh, metal thing, but um, eventually uh, you'd have to make a new page or something like that. And that is very time consuming to do wood carving. And what the printing press allows, or the movable type printing press allows, it allows you to create a bunch of little letters that are made out of a iron or something like that, uh, that then can be reused over and over and over again. And you can put them in whatever order you want. And now you have pages that you can print out. And it makes books significantly cheaper and faster to produce. Uh, prices will jump plummet by 20%, which means you can get this to more middle class or even some low class people, which is going to lead to an increase in education. Uh, it's going to lead to getting messages out to lead that will help start political revolutions or religious revolutions. The main one being the Reformation. Um, the One of the major leaders of the Reformation, a guy named Martin Luther, is going to produce, I can't remember what the statistics is off the top of my head, so I apologize, but uh, he is responsible for like 60, 70 percent of the works that were produced at that time and sold. So, yeah, you have a lot of stuff going on and these guys helping each other out with that kind of stuff. Um, some of the other books, I didn't really bring up the other books. I brought up the prints, but some other books are, are a book named Don Quixote uh, that is about a Spanish uh, knight going on a crazy quest. Uh, you might read it in one of your Spanish classes at some point. It's a great book. Uh, there's Dante's Divine Comedy, uh, which is about Dante's... Um, uh, journey through hell, through purgatory, and then through heaven. And there's the Canterbury Tales, which is one of the first uh, truly English works of literature uh, that uh, talks about people on a uh, pilgrimage going to see Canterbury and everyone telling stories on their journey to get there. Now, I brought that that was in English. Uh, Dante's Divine Comedy is in Latin, or not, sorry, Latin, in, in Italian. Don Quixote's is in Spanish. And this is a huge deal because books were not usually written in the native language or vernacular. Usually they were written in uh, Latin, which was the 
uh, kind of English of the day in that anyone that was educated knew Latin. Uh, and so that was the lingua franca or the main language. But now things are shifting to people's vernacular. And so now you're going to have Italian developing more and becoming the Italian that we know today. French becoming the French of today, uh, Spanish becoming the Spanish that we know today, English becoming the English language that we know today. Um, Shakespeare is going to be really uh, important with that because he's going to invent a lot of words or at least use the words for the first time in a written source. Now, the Renaissance doesn't just spread in Italy or just stay in Italy in the city-states there. It will spread beyond that, especially with the help of the printing press. Uh, it's going to go to Spain, France, uh, Germany, which is the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the Netherlands, and also to England. So um, it goes to all these places uh, through the printing press, also through merchants and through artists going and studying down in those regions to learn the techniques. And then they bring the techniques back and share those techniques with their peers. The Northern Renaissance, though, is going to be fairly different from the Italian Renaissance. Yes, there's going to be some of the same values of like humanism and realism and stuff like that going on. Uh, but it's also fairly different in that uh, there's more of a focus on daily life uh, and the average people. Uh, there's a much more devotedness in it to Christianity. So you're going to see a lot more religious works. Um, it's going to be based around the monarchies that are up there because they can sponsor the artwork and get themselves painted and, and paint other have other things painted that they want to see. And uh, there's also going to be wood engravings. That wasn't something the Italians did a lot, but uh, the bottom picture you see to the left uh, is a picture of, uh, is not actually a picture or anything like that. It's a uh, wood engraving. So this was carved into wood to then be pressed into a book so that you would have artwork in that book. So that's the Northern Renaissance. The next step in the Renaissances or a Renaissance is, leads us into the scientific revolution uh, where you have all this question going on with the arts that eventually shifts over to the sciences and really to the natural world and trying to understand, well, how does this world work? And so it shows the skepticism and secularism and things and that we're going to get discoveries like, oh, the earth is not the center of the solar system. Instead, it's the sun or that there's a thing called gravity that's keeping us down and it can be calculated as well as because of gravity, uh, objects fall at the same rate uh, no matter what they are. So as long as they are the same size and shape. So if we take a beach ball that is full of air and we take a beach ball that is, um, well, maybe let's not say full of air. Uh, if we take a beach ball that is full of water and we take a beach ball that is made out of concrete and we drop them at the same time, as long as they were the same size, they are going to hit the ground at the same time. Uh, that was a famous experiment done by Galileo. Um, the heliocentrism is kind of figured out by Nicholas Copernicus and a guy named Johannes Kepler. Uh, they worked that out. Galileo proves that. And the, um, uh, the calculation for gravity and all that stuff comes from the idea of creating a new math called calculus by a guy named Isaac Newton. And a guy named Rene Descartes and Sir Francis Bacon create the scientific method, which gives us the way to kind of prove a scientific idea. Uh, it gets us into the being able to prove theories and come up with theories and actually show that they exist instead of just saying, well, I think this is what the case is. They come up with a way with actually doing experimentation, prediction, all that kind of stuff. The scientific revolution, or at the same time the scientific revolution happens, there's also the Protestant and Catholic Reformation happening. This is showing skepticism infiltrating the church and that you have people challenging the norms of the church and that the Catholic church should be the head of it. Uh, we're not going to talk about that a ton here, uh, but it is something to make note of, and it is something that we will go into when we come back from winter break. And then last but not least, we have the Age of Discovery, and this is something we will come back into at the start of next semester after winter break. And that is the Age of Discovery also is happening at this same time. So you got Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue, um, but you have a lot of other people then Christopher Columbus also doing that, trying to go and discover and find ways to the Far East to go and uh, buy stuff there and bring it back. So get silk, go get spices, all that kind of stuff that the Europeans want. Now that they're in this uh, new time period of abundance and that trade is improving, there's lots of money, uh, people want to find it to spend. They're not just going to spend it on art, but they're going to spend it on getting resources that they want. So other luxuries like silk and other things like that. So um, that's kind of uh, all, all, this thing, all, all these things are happening while the Renaissance is happening. So you got the Renaissance with the Northern, eventually the Northern Renaissance is in addition to that, with the Reformation, with the Scientific Revolution, with this Age of Exploration, all happening at the same time. 
making this a very dynamic period. Um, again, we're not going to look at them all at the same time, but understand our next couple of units, everything's happening around the same time here. So that's everything in a nutshell for the Renaissance. Um, we'll be exploring a lot more of it in class over the next few days.